And welcome back to another edition of Your Adrenal Fix, where we teach exhausted and burnt out adults the truth about their health so that they can get their energy back quickly. And today, what a real pleasure. I'm joined with Anders Olsen. He's a trainer. He's an author. He's an innovator. He's the founder of The Conscious Breathing. He's been on an incredible journey when he's decided to be the world's foremost expert in breathing. Um, his mind was racing his whole life, and he was fortunate to come across different tools um, to help him with his inner calm, and he's really settled in on, on the Conscious Breathing Retraining Program, and I'll let him explain his entire story today and how this will help you with your stress response and being exhausted and burnt out. So with, more, with no more further ado, Anders, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Joel, for having me. Yeah, so I always like to get a, a little bit of your background, and I know you were in the import of computers and gadgets and so forth. And what was it that made you finally realize that you've got to you've got to change the trajectory that you're on? Well, you know, I was just uh, chasing money and and uh, having these long to do lists and a lot of inner stress, and didn't feel fulfilled, felt empty inside, and. Uh, Although the money I chased, they they started to come in, and and uh, that's what you think may be the the key to success, to to happiness. But I found out it it wasn't. So um, that's when I started to look at uh, health, become interested in health, and it coincided with my with my son when he was six years old, and he was diagnosed with Lyme disease, and uh, he didn't feel well at all. And at the time, my view on uh, the, the hospital and, and the doctor and the healthcare system was very like I lived in the computer world. So it was very binary. Either you, you take a test and either you're healthy or you're sick. Uh, and uh, that was not a case. I realized when I came there with my son that there was a lot of guesswork, a lot of uh, ways of interpreting the results. It was not black or white, which of course makes a lot of sense because our body is hugely complex. But for me, when my son didn't feel well, it was a, a way for me trying to help him and digging into how the body works. And ever since I've been stuck in that because it's so, so, so fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for sharing. I, I, uh, I do a lot of nutrigenomic interpretations, which in English means we look at your genome and we mm. look at the overlapping environmental talk triggers, if you will, that... Uh, end up causing the loaded genetic gun to go off and creating this perfect storm of genetic susceptibilities and environmental triggers that create exhaustion, fatigue, burnout. And Anders, one of the areas on that studies th that studies that we look at is on the entire, we call it the Fenton reaction side of the pyramid, which is, of course, when oxygen mixes with iron. And it's another way that our respiratory cellular ability to use oxygen breaks down. But the whole point of what I'm trying to get at is the gentleman that formulated that software, he, he, he won a lot of studies in ILADS, which is in the conferences of Lyme disease. And he found that majority of people that get hit harder, everything else being equal in terms of health challenges, are these ones that have these genetic susceptibilities of not moving iron out of tissue. So they can't open the doorway for iron to get out. They can't convert vitamin uh, beta carotene into vitamin A. They have difficulty with transporting uh, uh, copper, very difficult times with recycling their iron. And it has to do with pretty much what you've discovered is that if you're not breathing at that cellular level effectively, any other environmental triggers are going to make you that much more worse. So I guess the question would be in that process with your son and with your own health, um, where did oxygen or how did oxygen come into the equation? <laughs> yeah, it was a, a few years later when I read a book, actually, How to Swap Asthma for Life by Changing Your Breathing. And uh, uh, it had a profound effect on me, on my ability to calm down. I've had this racing mind for the majority of my life. And uh, looking back, I realized that what I wanted more than anything was a way, a simple yet effective way to calm down. 
And I tried many different things, changing my eating habits, uh, training habits, drinking habits, working habits. But it was when I found out about changing your breathing habits, that was the key for me. It has such a huge impact. So almost immediately, I, I noticed the effect. Just by turning to my breath and change it, I could uh, notice the effect on um, being able to calm down. And I thought, this is way too good to keep to myself. I really want to, to spread it to the world. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so reading that book, you realize that, uh, that breathing plays a significant role in, in your racing mind. I guess, take us through the evolution from there, I guess, in terms of what you've learned since then, or what you've developed. I know that's a very broad question, but I guess start us out at the beginning where you're like, okay, this is too good to, to not share with the rest of the world, but take us through as your knowledge base got um, bigger and what you decided to do with, with your own business. Yeah. So I started to focus uh, all my attention on breathing and I trained to become a, a yoga instructor. I trained in the Bateko method, uh, the Russian professor, late professor Konstantin Bateko, and many, many other modalities and read tons of research reports and, and books and uh, uh, tried everything with my own body. And one of the 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 uh, the main thing I discovered when was the benefits of carbon dioxide and how it helps you to, to regain that balance between activity and recovery and the realization that with every breath, actually, we regulate our nervous system. With the inhale, we go in a direction towards activation and fight flight, while the exhale is the opposite. Ah, if I'm exaggerating, we, we don't normally breathe like that, of course, but inhale activation, exhalation is... Um, relaxation and recovery and parasympathetic and uh, in my view there is a, a huge misunderstanding we have an obsession with oxygen we, we think it's only about oxygen of course we know that we are super dependent on oxygen because if we stop breathing for just a couple of minutes we will die so of course oxygen is crucial in order to produce energy efficiently and then we may think that carbon dioxide is just a simple waste product. And I try to tell the story that it's about balance, which almost anything in life is about, right? Our car doesn't go better just because we give it more fuel. It will be just as bad to have too much as to have too little. The same with water or with, with anything. It should be a balance. So our breathing should mimic our body's needs at, at any given time, which means that it is different when I'm sitting in the sofa watching TV or if I'm out uh, running. And this obsession with oxygen, what we have a tendency to forget is that the only possible explanation why we store so little oxygen in our body so that we can only survive for a few minutes, there has to be a reason for that. If we compare to the, the amount of uh, fat and sugar and water and other things we have stored in our body, there are huge reserves, but oxygen is still enough to go by a couple of minutes. And the only reason that I can think of is that um, oxygen is toxic. So that's the reason why our body stores as little supply as possible. Because we, we know that, for example, if I take a bite in an apple and put it down, the apple will turn brown in just a, a short period of time. So in general, we want to protect our food from oxygen, right? Because oxygen is extremely reactive. That's why it's so important when we want to produce energy in our mitochondria, which we also call the, the powerhouses, the furnaces. There are fires burning in our body, in the mitochondria. And when you add oxygen to a fire, it will burn um, better. But of course, if you earn, um, add too much oxygen, it will... Um, explode basically because oxygen is so extremely reactive so that means it is not good to oh i took a big breath now i'm oxygenating my body better no actually you don't you, you may create more oxygen free radicals which we also call oxidative stress and inflammations so that is the one aspect of 
uh, how many of us are breathing. We have a tendency to breathe fast and shallow, or we uh, may breathe through our mouth, or we hold our breath. Uh, in a, we breathe in a more chaotic way. And all of these can be seen as overbreathing, which means we take in more oxygen than our body needs. So we increase the oxidative stress because when we at, at rest with a normal breathing rate, which most people don't seem to have a normal breathing rate, according to medical textbooks, is about six liters per minute. Many studies show that we may breathe eight or 10 or 15 liters per minute. So in this normal uh, breathing rate, uh, breathing volume of six liters per minute, we only use up a quarter of the oxygen we inhale. The rest, 75% is exhaled. So already at a, a low breathing volume, a very low and slow and rhythmic breathing that most of us don't engage in, we only use up very little of the oxygen we take in. So taking a big breath, it's a complete misunderstanding. We do not oxygenate our body better. So that is the one aspect. The other aspect is carbon dioxide. And it turns out that carbon dioxide is as far away from a just a simple waste product as we can ever come. It has many, many different um, important properties in our body, including helping the smooth muscles relax. We, we have the heart muscles and we have the, the skeletal muscles that we can control by will. And then we have the smooth muscles and they surround the airways, the blood vessels, the stomach, the intestines and so forth. And when carbon dioxide goes down, which it does when we overbreathe, we breathe slightly faster, then we take in more oxygen and exhale more carbon dioxide. So we lower the levels of carbon dioxide in our body. And when it does, we will then uh, make these smooth muscles uh, constrict uh, because carbon dioxide works closely with nitric oxide. So basically we can say when carbon dioxide levels go down, nitric oxide production goes down. And uh, nitric oxide um, is what is actually stimulating the smooth muscles to relax and widen. So in essence, what I'm trying to say is that when you hyperventilate, the uh, airways will constrict, they will get more narrow airways and, and lungs, as well as the blood vessels. So there will be more friction, it will be harder for the air to flow, harder for the blood to flow. So your body had to uh, work harder to oxygenate um, the muscles, the liver, the brain, etc. No, it's, it's amazing. I'm, I appreciate the nuances that you've picked up in your study, uh, really, because you can see how evol evolutionarily our body has adapted based on the cues of life, right? And you think about, and you will probably agree with this, over the millennia, the, the, the programmed stress response whenever there's a increase of, uh, of, of unlikelihood for survival, being eaten for food or prey, um, mm -hmm. It's going to create a sympathetic response, which is going to shuttle uh, important nutrients away from the parasympathetic and more for the fleeing. Um, and then ideally that that trigger goes away and we get back on with our life. However, as you've noted as well, um, not just the rising CO2 levels in the environment, but chemicals and toxins and waste products and EMFs and social media and pesticides and sprays and heavy metals and viruses and 5G and dope, uh, you know, cell, cell text messages and stuff. I think it keeps us in a constant hypoxic state, if you will, in terms of we're not getting enough oxygen and or we're, we're not getting enough buildup of CO2. So I guess the question would be, does was that was missing um unders in terms of when you did all your own research that no one was really emphasizing the importance of co2 or they were over exaggerating the importance of o2 w was that where you found your little niche in terms of your area of i can bring this information to to the masses yeah i think that's a good way to put it yeah and and my main discovery, so I worked with this since 2009, and 
it was in 2010 when I uh, I already in the beginning started with nasal breathing, restricting my breathing, breathing lower and slower, lower using my diaphragm, slowing down my breathing. And I realized that that type of breathing, also breathing through my nose, that helps you to restore the balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide. You take in a little less oxygen, you maintain a little more carbon dioxide. So when I started applying those simple principles when doing physical activity, uh, I noticed that when I increased that, so for example, when I went out for a jog, uh, I took a one hour jog and I decided to do what I call carbon dioxide training or oxygen restriction training. And if you look at different training concepts today, they, they are actually doing that. When you go to high altitude, a lot of elite athletes do. They go to high altitude to increase the blood's oxygen carrying capacity. And at higher altitude, the oxygen levels are lower. So the body needs to respond to that. So more red blood cells are released into the blood and more are manufactured. And also more carbon dioxide is retained in the body. And uh, also when you do high intense interval training, it's the same. You are not able to deliver enough oxygen to your muscles and you're not able to get rid of all the carbon dioxide. So it's similar to doing high altitude training. It's oxygen restriction and carbon dioxide loading. If you do katsu, if you know that, the, the Japanese method where you basically put a strap over the muscle that you want to exercise, again, you restrict oxygen and uh, you uh, um, keep more carbon dioxide in the area and the, the muscle will get stronger and bigger, faster. So what I discovered when I went out for this carbon dioxide uh, training uh, jog, which meant that I was only breathing through my nose and trying to breathe as few breaths per minute as possible, taking, for example, two, three steps on the inhale and six to eight steps on the exhale. And it was tough. Every single step was really tough. I felt, oh, I want to take a big breath. I, but I fooled myself, well, next tree, next lamppost, and then I can take a big breath. But then I, again, I set a new small target. So eventually I made it home uh, for about one hour and then the reward came. I was so extremely harmonious and calm. I sat down at the kitchen table and felt extremely harmonious, a, a level I haven't experienced. Yeah, maybe when I got my, my two kids, but it was on that level. And three, um, three hours later, I was still sitting there, just super relaxed, <laughs> wondering what the heck was going on. So I think that was my real starting point to realize the importance of carbon dioxide. If we want to be smarter, kinder, and happier, it's a key to find a balance uh, between the two. Yeah, no, that's great uh, observation. Thank you for sharing. I know that David St. Clair talks about aging is really the breakdown of communication inside the body. And mm -hmm. I think if you think about what oxygen is, especially if it's toxic, it's a chemical messenger. Same mm -hmm. thing with, with carbon dioxide. If it's not low or if it need, it, it's starting to build up, it's a chemical messenger. Um, and it puts our body in, um, we call a danger response. And I right. use the analogy of, think of it as the danger response at the macro level, where let's say you have a, a very low income and you have a lot of expenses, your mm -hmm. body is not going to be able to keep up with the demand. And it's going to prioritize what expenses do get met in order to survive. And then as you build up a surplus, now you're not just paying interest payments only, but you're paying into the principal. Mm -hmm. So I guess paying into the principal would be the added effects that you've listed beyond the blissfulness. So maybe we can talk some about that, that once you've been doing this for a, a long period of time and you retrain your body in terms of having it be more natural with the conscious breathing uh, program, what can we expect with additional improvements? I guess it's a two-part question. What is the conscious breathing program and, and what additional effects can we anticipate beyond just 
um, paying back interest payments, if you will, but you know, cutting into the into the deficit. Yeah. So if we we'll start with the, the second question, ultimately, I think it's uh, uh, longevity. Because if you start studying this, you, you you realize that animals that have figured this out that are able to live on lower levels of oxygen and tolerate higher levels of carbon dioxide, they live longer. One of the most uh, studied animals is the naked mole rat. It's uh, just a, a small rat, but it lives up to 30 years, which is 10 to 15 times longer than its cousin, uh, the, the normal rat. And uh, when uh, it does not uh, suffer from oxidative stress, doesn't suffer from osteoporosis, it has a low breathing frequency. And even when you inject cancer cells into the, the naked mole rat, it does not de develop cancer. So, and, and, and other animals as well. If you look at a termite queen can live up to 50 years and ant queen up to 30 years. They live a, in the nest a, below the ground where there are high levels of carbon dioxide because all mammals uh, are carbon dioxide factories, right? Producing carbon dioxide. So it's similar to us people. If we come together in, in a room and, and some will complain after a while, oh, I don't like the air quality. That person has low tolerance for carbon dioxide, most likely, because that is what happened. You shift, the, you lower the oxygen slightly and you increase the carbon dioxide slightly. So that would be the ultimate, uh, I think, evidence of uh, learning to tolerate this, uh, finding the right balance. And, and honestly, this is very important. That is something that we are not aware of. Um, you mentioned it earlier, the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But it's not like if we compare to when it's very cold, we just realize that it's cold and then we uh, act accordingly. We, we put on more clothes or if it's very warm, we adapt to that. But the increase of carbon dioxide exposure to, to the human body is going very slow. So when we talk about global warming, it's all about the increase of carbon dioxide and how horrible that is for the environment. But we don't realize that this increase, which is about 35% in the atmosphere in the last 65 years, that affects our metabolism as well, because it is not lack of oxygen that makes us take the next breath. It is the buildup of carbon dioxide in our bodies. So carbon dioxide stimulates breathing. And if you... Uh, then are exposed to more carbon dioxide. And that is not only from the increase in the atmosphere. We spend about 90% of our time indoors and we get more and more people on this planet. So, so we, and we live in bigger and bigger cities. So we come together more and more people. So typical indoor air could contain two to three times as much carbon dioxide as the atmospheric air. If you uh, uh, sleep two person in a bedroom with the, window and doors closed. Typically in the morning hours after a few nights sleep, the levels in the bedroom will be maybe seven, eight, 10 times as high as the atmospheric air. And if you go in a car, the levels could also reach very high levels within a short period of time. If you wear a face mask, which was very popular during COVID, also your increase uh, to carbon dioxide uh, uh, exposure is, is increased and, and the oxygen reduction. So I think a very important message that I try to get across is that we have to understand that our exposure to carbon dioxide increases. And if you don't deal with it, if you don't learn to tolerate it, you will end up in a permanent state of stress because it drives breathing <laughs> And uh, at some point, you will just continue breathing very fast, very shallowly, and you will have a huge problem because that, there are numerous studies linking overbreathing, the fast, shallow breathing to a number of health issues. And um, yeah, and, and of course, uh, so, so in my view, carbon dioxide is something good. And if you learn to tolerate it, then the benefit is that you will increase your consciousness. That was what I felt when I 
went out for this jog uh, 13 years ago um, and felt, you know, uh, aligned with everything <laughs> in the universe, sort of, that that la la land, that happiness, harmonious feeling, that being in the zone. Uh, and uh, that is the benefit of, of learning to tolerate. So it's basically a, a divider, a crossroad. Either you learn to tolerate it and you will grow as a person, or you do not learn to tolerate the increased levels of CO2 and you end up in more stress. So uh, that is the answer to question number two. And now I've forgotten question. <laughs> well, I remember number one was a little bit more about conscious breathing program, but we'll get there in a second because I want to make a comment on that. So yeah. um, it, it seems like that the buildup of carbon dioxide is the most fundamental hormetic stressor that we need to be able to, to adapt to. And when I say hormesis, hormesis is the exposures of stressors, toxins, environmental triggers that make us stronger over time by adapting to it. And when I say someone has very little surplus or their demand and supply has been so unequal for so long, that even their autonomic nervous system is not being able to regulate itself because you're so far behind on the bills, if you will, that you're not even paying for power and you know, food on the table. Um, no. That's where your body's not able to regulate its temperature. When it's cold, you it's hard to warm up. When it's hot, it's hard to cool down. When you stand up, you get a drop of blood pressure. You might feel lightheaded. When you go up a flight of stairs, your your heart rate seems to be a rhythmic and, and it seems to be very fluttery. Um, so I, I think it's really important um, with what you're saying. The next leap is you can't separate the emotional component to that either, right? Yeah. Whereas let's say that's happening to me emotionally as higher order you you know beings and creatures we now have that far you know the upper part of the brain where we attach meaning and purpose to it and then we start to get freaked out oh my god this isn't good i'm awful i'm going to die i feel that's where i think the emotional component comes in where if you can regulate that breathing so mm -hmm. that you're tolerating the co2 and you're creating that increased blood flow to the areas of the brain that is enriching it, enriching it, but it's not dominated by that limbic center of fight or flight and fear. Mm -hmm. I, I think, would you agree? I guess the question is, would you agree that as you be able to tolerate these uh, carbon dioxide tolerance, that naturally it, 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 it stands to reason that the only way you're gonna do that is by shutting off the emotional, negative, sympathetic uh, context that's being placed on it. Does does that make sense? The the question that I'm asking you. I I mean, studies show that there is a, a emotional breathing. So if I am angry, my breath signature uh, has a specific angry uh, signature. If I'm stressed out. I have a different stress, uh, a different breathing, um, which studies have, have shown. So by uh, there was a very interesting study where they took a group of people and have them uh, try to uh, go into specific emotions and then afterwards describing their breathing. And there were specific patterns for uh, specific emotional states. And then they took another group and ask them to breathe in that specific way. And they were able to get into that emotion just by breathing in that specific way. So it goes um, both ways, right? Uh, your breathing is a reflection of your, your states, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And by changing the way you breathe, you can change these states. Um, right, right. It, it's, you know, it's almost like the reverse Pavlovian dog experiments mm -hmm. where you have the the bell that rings and then you give the dog some powder to make it salivate and then you no longer need to give it the powder because the bell has been paired with the stimuli yeah. but in this case you're you're asking the natural reflexive response of fear to be changed in terms of everything's okay slow down your breathing conscientiously feel the release or, you know, really train your brain. I guess that would be a good segue into conscious breathing and the program that you've developed. 
how important is the thought process besides the mechanical extra breaths out, less breaths in, or timing? How important is the actual conscientiousness or the emotional state when faced with those stressors, Anders, in your program? Yeah, so first, if we just uh, address what is conscious breathing. So first, it's it's a way to understand my nervous system, being able to read it and, and realize that as I mentioned earlier, with every breath, we, we shift uh, with every breathing cycle, we shift between activation and relaxation. And many of us seems to be stuck in a state of stress and activation and fight flight, which is not bad per se, of course, we, we need it. But the problem is if we there too often for too long. So that, that is the, the, the first pillar. The second pillar is the breath knowledge and the breath awareness, the understanding of what happens in our body when we breathe, that gives us a why, which makes it easy to engage in different breathing exercises, not just because someone tells you to, to do something, but you also understand that the nose is there to protect your lungs. It uh, helps you to, to clean the bacteria and viruses that we inhale. It helps you to warm and humidify the air, etc. cetera. And, and the, the other part of that is the, the breath awareness, the awareness of your daily breathing habits. How are you breathing when you talk, when, when you eat, when you do physical activity? Is there a connection between uh, when you're stressed out and, and uh, is your breathing then shallow and fast or do you hold your breath when, when concentrating? So starting to pay attention to that and get an awareness, that is usually the first step towards change understanding oh my god there is a connection i don't know where it comes from i'm i'm dead scared and then when i look at my breathing my breathing pattern is also uh, dead scared and then we can do something about it so the, the third pillar of conscious breathing is to to help you uh, calm your nervous system you can of course go in both directions you can easily activate your nervous system just by <laughs> starting to breathe faster and, and shallow or hold your breath. But what we found is that most people like to have tools to calm their nervous system. And it's very simple. The principles uh, are very simple. The, the typical hallmarks of activation breathing is mouth breathing, fast breathing, shallow breathing, holding the breath, noisy breathing, uh, labored breathing. And if you want to change from a state of fight flight into a state of uh, safe and secure and, and uh, rest and digest, you just do the opposite. Close your mouth, uh, breathe low using your diaphragm, slow and rhythmically and quiet. And, and the best way to do that is usually just to, to close your mouth and prolong your exhale slightly. Right. And and I guess, is there a step four, step five, where you start to pair it with a, a positive emotion or a celebration or a gratitude or a different form of energy that shows up besides the sympathetic thoughts that are automatically um, paired with the with the with all those four ways of breathing? Yeah. So within conscious breathing, we have the in exhale exercises, which are both physical exercises to help you open up your airways. And because even though our diaphragm is our most important breathing muscle and it's supposed to do 70 to 80% of the muscular work, moving the air in and out of the lungs at rest. But there are many different muscles in our neck and throat and, and back and uh, chest that that are involved in, in breathing. And many of them, if they are stiff and tense, they will inhibit the, uh, the flow of air. It will make it harder to breathe. So these exercises help to, um, to open up the, the airways, make it easier for the air to flow in and out of the lungs. And, and the other uh, part of the in exhale exercises are ones that help you to find your inner calm, like guided, uh, relaxation exercises. Right, right, excellent. So that's great. So then as far as I know, you've also developed a couple of tools besides your course. Um, yeah. One is the body stream dry CO2 bath. So I'm very interested to discuss that, how that came about and 
and, mm -hmm. and giving our listeners exactly what that does um, in terms of harnessing CO2. So maybe you can elaborate on how you came up with that. Yeah, so the, the carbon dioxide uh, uh, suit we call body stream, it was, uh, is, is, if you imagine an astronaut sort, uh, suit that you put on and then you vacuum pump out all the air and then you fill it up with carbon dioxide and then the carbon dioxide is absorbed through the skin. And uh, it turns out that hot springs, which has been popular for centuries, that the, the main effect people get from them, they, they notice an effect on the heart, on the circulation, on the skin, and, and the, the mental capacity, the, the ability to calm down. The major effect uh, from these hot springs is actually carbon dioxide. And since not all of us can have a hot spring in our backyard, uh, uh, there has been uh, ways of developing alternatives and, and the dry carbon dioxide bath is, is one of those. So, so it's not, our product is not unique in that sense. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, as I mentioned earlier, I've studied carbon dioxide a lot and, and see so many benefits. When you read studies, uh, I read a few studies today. Uh, one was about the increase of um, muscular uh, mitochondria when exposed to carbon dioxide. Another one was where they, they, they broke the legs on 140 rats and, and they exposed them to carbon dioxide. And it was a, a huge improvement in, in the healing when exposed to carbon dioxide compared to the control group. And right. Yeah, so there are many, many effects. And what we describe it is uh, as parasympathetic to looks uh, because it really helps people to wind down. And that's where if we, we, a popular term is to boost your immune system. And I think the optimum way of doing that or, or one of the best way of doing that is just to calm down because then there will be a lot of energy for the um, uh, immune system. Right, right. Excellent. And uh, as far as the relaxador, tell us a little bit about that. I'm interested to know about how how that works and how that helps for, for carbon dioxide tolerance. Yeah, so the whole principle of conscious breathing is actually to help restore the balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide. So whether it's the body stream or it's the relaxator and the other products we have, it's about restricting the oxygen intake slightly and um, increasing the carbon dioxide tolerance by simply slowing down our breathing. So the relaxator gives you a resistance on the out breath. You put it in your mouth, you inhale through the nose and out through the relaxator and you set a resistance very easily of your choice. And then you prolong the exhale slightly. So this little device then helps you to slow down your breathing getting a low and slow and rhythmic breathing that more than anything, I would say, gives the brain a steady supply of oxygen. So if I'm uh, in a, um, if I had a, have a tight deadline or if I just need to concentrate and want to be focused. So for example, right now I'm updating my book. It's a fantastic tool because the brain doesn't need any pauses. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not taking any pauses, but I have come to realize that the reason why, oh, I need to go to the bathroom, I need to have a cup of coffee, I need to call my best friend, I need to clean the toilet or whatever, when we're engaging in these uh, uh, tasks that, that demand a lot of us, the brain figures out ways to, to take us away from that. And I think a major reason for that is because we either shift between either breathing too fast or holding our breath, which disturbs the oxygen supply to the brain. And that means the brain gets stressed out. More than anything, it wants to predict what's coming and it wants to predict the oxygen supply. So if you can have this rhythmic low and slow breathing, the brain will calm down and it's easy for you to stay focused for a long time. So, okay, so that is, that. would you suggest that with, with a bunch of different tasks that we normally 
um, get fidgety with or just at any time or with walking meditation? What's the best way to, to use that device? Oh, so I mainly use it in front of my computer um, when working, but many people, they love using it in the car before going to sleep, maybe in the bed or before getting up in the morning when watching TV, when cooking, all kinds of situations. Since it's so little and lightweight, you can uh, have it in your mouth for a long time without a problem. And any situation where you find, okay, I have some... Um, uh, it's possible for me to also do breathing retraining. For example, if I'm in the car half an hour or an hour every day, it's a perfect way of retraining your breathing, helping you to achieve this rhythmic, low, slow breathing more and more often. Right. Excellent. Okay. And um, as far as I have a couple other questions, I know that one of the big things that you talk about is sleep. So maybe we could explain why balancing your CO2 and your O2 in, in, in conscious breathing will have an impact on your sleep. Yeah, so uh, we recommend everyone to tape their mouth shut at night. Uh, so we have developed a product for this called Sleep Tape. And I participated a few years ago in a study at Stanford together with James Nestor, who wrote the book Breath, where he talks about this study quite a bit. And what we did was for 10 days and 10 nights, we blocked our nose so we could only breathe through our mouth. And our sleep was the, the, the thing that got most negatively affected. And we, we, I went from no snoring, for example, to three hours of snoring per night. I, I woke every uh, morning with dry as a desert in my mouth. And, and during the night, I, I was uh, fidgeting, um, bouncing back and forth and, and waking up many times. And then after these 10 days, we did uh, so and, and we did a, a number of uh, tests every day. I think we tested uh, things around three hours per day, uh, from blood to uh, HRV to standing on one leg to uh, doing push-ups, a lot of things. And then we did 10 days of conscious breathing, which included taping our mouth, shut at night and again i was down to no snoring at all it was a huge difference uh, comparing the two so uh, we all know the, the effect that bad night sleep has on our performance and our mood the next day but we have a tendency i would say in today's society to not prioritize our sleep we wake up to the alarm which basically means that we drag our body out of the bed when it's not fully rested the body wants to stay in bed but our mind forces it, it to go up so uh, sleep is crucial for everything from learning if if uh, if you uh, read a book and i uh, uh, question you about the content of the book and i do that the same day your results will not be as good as if i question you the next day because during the night, the brain will be able to, uh, uh, all the stimuli that you have been exposed to during the day will be sorted and categorized and put in different boxes and so that you can understand, get a, the, the bigger picture. And also the brain is cleaned uh, at night. It's like when you go to bed, you push the button to the dishwasher and, and um, washing machine because and that is quite recent discovered right we have our body's lymphatic system which is our sewage system to get rid of waste products the brain's cleaning system is called the glymphatic system and that is not active at daytime it's only when we sleep and it's not only about the hours it's also about the quality of our sleep so i think that is crucial sleep is is so uh underrated i would say yeah no i think it, you're just it's interesting to see your and hear your evolution of of the balancing of the fine the fine act between too little and too much and i'm glad and and thank you for really shedding light on the importance of the oxygen ca carbon dioxide balance mm -hmm. um because ultimately if you're, I, I've said this a lot with the people we work with that are exhausted, tired, burnt out is 
you either have oxygen work for you or you have oxygen work against you. It, yeah. It's not really a, a in between, if you will. And if you are able to harness oxygen effectively so that you're making ATP and energy and carbon dioxide, and that's in a good balance, and that's right out of biochemistry 101, then there's going to be less stress or drag, or and that's what the definition of mechanical stress is, right? Whenever there's an unclean formula and yeah. vice versa, if you're not able to do that, um, then you're going to have oxygen use work against you and, and, and so many challenges. I guess one more area I'd get into is if someone's listening to this and you have a lot of great um, information and, and blog posts and articles on your website, which we'll post a link to and, and be able to hopefully offer our listener a, a discount on your products. Um, yeah. Why is it that it would help and facilitate weight loss or fat loss? Well, in, in order to, I mean, I mean we, we usually burn fat or sugar, right, in our body to produce energy. And sugar can be fermented outside of the mitochondria, but fat cannot. Fat needs oxygen to be burned. So if we start to um, engage in this overbreathing, if we start to, to have an imbalance between oxygen and carbon dioxide, there will be areas of our body that will receive less oxygen than it needs. And, and then we're basically shutting the door slightly to our fat reserves. So we have seen that over and over how people uh, that um, start to slow down their breathing, they open up the doors to their fat reserves. They are able to uh, burn more fat and uh, um which is it, it it makes a lot of sense. and And if you study people that are overweight, there are very, very few, to be honest, when they are walking, and even if uh, sometimes when they are sitting, they have their mouth open, which is the hallmark of stress breathing, poor oxygenation. right. Yeah, no, I, I I'm glad you shared that insight because it, it is again, out of uh, biochemistry of one oh one, aerobic respiration is using oxygen. So I always say you're either using oxygen for you or you're not. Mm. Um, so I always like to ask my guests when we're coming to the end here, Anders, um, mm. knowing what you know now versus what you didn't know then, um, what would you have told the younger version of yourself um, that you know now a lot sooner than you had to figure out to help your help your your, your quality of life or your purpose or or just overcome stressors, what would that youthful sort of sage-like information you would have told your younger self, what would that have been? I would have told my younger self to shut your mouth and, and uh, prolong your exhale. For everything we just said, right? Because that will help you balance carbon dioxide, be able to increase blood flow, be able to turn off your sympathetic system, be able yes. to produce more energy effectively with less free radicals and be able to ultimately get where you would. But then you might not have discovered all these other, you may not have gotten down these other pathways. Curious, how how is your son doing now? Oh, I mean, that was when he was six. He's now 25. So, so okay. no worries there. He's doing fine. But he, he got... Um, help with the uh, traditional uh, medical treatment with uh, strong doses of antibiotics. Okay. And I hope he's, he's a conscious breather as well now. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate your time. Uh, Anders Olsen, like we said, is the founder of Conscious Breathing. He's got amazing products uh, and being able to support your stress response so that you're, you're not living in that sympathetic fight or flight. And that's what I really like about what you do is, is that a lot of people will get on the magic diet or the, the like a, t a thousand and one different supplements. And really breathing is like you mentioned, is not just that we're supposed to breathe, but how are we supposed to breathe? is really key. And I thank you for your time. And we'll post links to all of your um, your information at the end of this podcast and wherever we're uploading it to social media. And I wish you nothing but continued success in your endeavors. And thank you for everything that you do.
Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Joel, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.